the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Independent research rates it the most popular radio program on the Pacific Coast. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with Signal, new Signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for Signal's big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular Signal stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, The Stray Dream. Chris Claggett was never meant to commit murder. He knew it the minute he did it. But of course, it was too late then. The minute it was over and he looked down at Steve Robinson lying there on the floor, he knew that nothing would be the same afterward. That no matter how perfect it was, no matter how thoroughly he outsmarted the police, the big battle was going to take place inside himself in the middle of his mind. He felt it even stronger two hours afterward as he paced the floor of his apartment, waiting for the telephone call that was bound to come sooner or later, trying to read and throwing the magazine aside, mixing drinks and pouring them down the sink, lighting cigarettes he was too nervous to smoke, waiting, waiting. Kathy was bound to call. She had to discover it sooner or later. Five minutes of two the night before Easter, Steve working late at the florist's shop, but she'd know he couldn't be working that late. She'd go down to see what was keeping him. And then she'd call. Chris was ready for it an hour ago with just the right amount of surprise and shock. But now, at five minutes of two, he didn't know. The waiting was getting him. And the silence. There it is, Chris. No, no, wait a minute. Let it ring. Now. Uh, hello? Chris, this is Kathy. Oh, Kathy, dear. You know better than to call me at this time. Chris, night. listen to me. Something terrible has happened. Huh? What's the matter? Steve. Steve is... He's dead, Chris. What? He was working late tonight at the flower shop. When he didn't come home, I went down and... and found him. I... I just called the police. Police? Yes, he... He's been murdered, Chris. Good Lord. Can you come down right away? Of course. Let me call the night editor first. I'll be right over. Well, Chris, at least the waiting is over. You carried it off pretty well, didn't you? Just the right amount of surprise and shock. But there's a strange new feeling inside, in the pit of your stomach, something you've never felt before. And the sight of Steve lying where you left him on the floor of the back room of the flower shop, surrounded by banks of Easter lilies and roses, brings the feeling to a dangerous pitch. You're thankful for your training. You don't even have to think as you watch Lieutenant Nelson. You're a police reporter. Your pencil moves automatically, taking down everything you see and hear. Well, what do you think, Chief? Uh, probably struck from behind as he was working at this bench. Yeah, but how did the guy get in? Didn't have to get in, Gibson. Could have reached in this open window. Oh, Claggett. Yeah? You'd better go and file your story. I don't think anything else will break tonight. Just photographs, fingerprint men, and that sort of thing. All right, Lieutenant. It's tough, I know. All murders are tough. I think the flowers here are what make this one so horrible. 
All this beauty and ugliness in the same little room. He was a friend of yours, wasn't he? Yeah. I'd better go, Lieutenant. What'll I tell Mrs. Robinson? Tell her I think she's had enough for one night. I'll uh, see her tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Well, Chris? It's pretty terrible, Kathy. What? What did Lieutenant Nelson say? You can go now. He'll see you tomorrow afternoon. Oh. I, uh, I gotta file my story. That's something, isn't it? Me filing a story about oh, Steve? Please, please, Chris. I'm sorry. I, I just... I, I know. Chris, I... I don't know what I'd do if... If you weren't here. I'll always be here, Kathy. Remember that, will you? Sure, Chris. I, I'll remember. <laughs> Just the right balance, Chris. Just enough grief and just enough business as usual. The outside battle is going well, isn't it? Tonight, the reporter, carrying on in spite of everything. Tomorrow, a little less grief, a little more business as usual. At the city editor's desk, for example. Oh, just a minute, Holloway. I tell you, I'm right, Chief. The door into the, into the sales room was locked. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Why? I remember. That's the trouble. You think you remember. Where's Chris? Over there at the counter. All right, we'll see. Oh, Chris. Yeah? Come here a minute. I'll show you what I mean, Holloway. What's the matter, Chief? Oh, Holloway here is doing a feature on the murder. He says the door into the sales room was locked. Check it, will you? Yeah, just a second. Uh, let me see. Oh, here we are. The door had a Yale lock, but it was on the latch and the bolt above it was open. Yeah, I see. Now, wait a minute. There was a triangular rubber door stop against it on the workroom side, so it couldn't have been used as an exit. That's it. See what I mean, Holloway? He doesn't trust his memory. He takes everything down. Well, that didn't seem very important. How do you know it's not important? Take it down anyway. But I was so busy... So was Chris. Doesn't matter how busy you are. A first-class man makes notes without even thinking about it. Right, Chris? Yeah, I suppose so. You see, Holloway? That's what I mean by a reporter. You're an expert, a precision machine. Accurate to a millionth of an inch, never wrong on a fact. Never guilty of bungling errors like the other reporters. And because you used the same methods to kill Steve Robinson, the outside battle was over before it started. Three months later, the case is shelved. Kathy's yours, Chris. She's Mrs. Claggett now. You have what you set out to get. Why don't you forget about the battle that's still going on inside? Yeah? Chris, where are the roses I put on the mantel? Roses? Oh, yeah, in the green vase on the mantel, dear. Oh, yeah, well, they, they're kind of wilted. I threw them out. Wilted? Oh, Chris, I just got them from the florist yesterday. Why must we always have flowers, Kathy? Well, be, because I like well, them. Well, I don't. What's the matter, dear? Ever since we got back from our I just honeymoon... don't like flowers, Kathy. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, don't jump at me. I'm sorry. What's wrong, Chris? You used to send me flowers before Steve and I... I know it. You don't have to tell me. It's very simple, Kathy. I don't like flowers because they remind me of Steve. That's why I want them. Huh? They remind me of Steve, too, Chris. I like to think of them once in a while. Why? Because I loved him. Kathy, don't you understand? I was fond of him, too. He was my best friend. But we're not living in the past. Keeping him in front of us all the time isn't going to help. Well... Is that why you objected to living here? Of course. He's here in the house with us. Everywhere I turn, I see him. Knickknacks of his all over the place. His picture on your dresser. Well, I, I thought you understood when we were married. I guess I didn't. Oh, excuse me, Kathy. I'm going to bed. And so you go to bed, Chris. But you don't sleep for hours. You haven't really slept since the murder, have you? And tonight, it's worse than ever. Your mind's like a spinning top. You aren't conscious of the exact moment it begins. But suddenly, you find yourself in the press section of a courtroom covering a trial. It's a courtroom different from any you've ever seen. Roses are everywhere. They cover the walls. They flow down over the judge's bench and up the aisles. The scent of them is almost sickening. 
There's a strange, cold feeling inside you as you take in all the details. The judge, the jury, the counsel for the defense and the prosecution. Then your heart almost stops as you realize that the man on trial for murder is you. Wait a minute. Let me explain. You got me all wrong. No, no, listen. I didn't... Uh, I didn't... Uh, I... Uh, I... Uh, the dream. What am I doing out of bed? Kathy, she heard me. No. Still asleep. Thank heaven. More coffee, Chris? No, thanks. Oh, you usually have two cups. I think I'll cut down a little. I didn't sleep too well last night. Oh? Must have been something I ate. You... You hear me tossing around? <laughs> no, I was dead to the world. I... I had the feeling when I woke up this morning I'd been talking in my sleep. You remember hearing anything? <laughs> no. You must have something on your conscience, dear. <sighs> yeah. Well, that's a relief, isn't it, Chris? It's a good thing Kathy sleeps soundly. You don't remember what you said, but no matter what it was, it would have sounded bad under the circumstances. You feel better that afternoon as you take Kathy downtown for a beauty appointment and get into the swing of things at the office. Then that evening... Chris, don't you think it might be a good idea to call off our bridge date with the Bartons tonight? You seem so tired. Yeah, I could use some sleep. You know, I've been thinking all afternoon about last night. Huh? What do you mean? Well, this morning when you asked me, I didn't remember anything unusual, but... This afternoon, the strangest feeling came You mean you me. heard me? Heard what? Oh, uh, well, you remember, I, I was telling you I had some crazy idea I'd been talking in my sleep. Oh, no, I didn't hear anything. Oh. I, I was just sitting here reading when I suddenly realized I had a funny dream. Oh, yeah? Well, maybe it's because of the roses. Roses? Well, yes, you remember, we talked about them before going you to bed. You mean you dreamed about roses? Well, yes, all, all mixed up with something about a trial and a courtroom. A court? Kathy, are you sure? What? Well, what's the matter, Chris? Is that all? Well, that's all I can remember. Chris, what's the matter? I... I don't know. With the prologue of tonight's story, The Stray Dream, Signal brings you another strange story by The Whistler. In place of the message about Signal gasoline, usually heard at this time on the Whistler, Signal Oil Company has asked me to talk with you about something much closer to the heart. About someone you may have forgotten to put on your Christmas list. I'm talking about a serviceman. One who won't be able to be home with his family and friends this Christmas because he's in a hospital. Recovering from wounds he suffered, fighting for his country and for you. Can't you imagine the happiness it would bring some serviceman on Christmas morning to receive a gift he wasn't expecting that would tell him, as nothing else could, that he hasn't been forgotten? It needn't be a large gift, but it should be something appropriate, something he could use. And the Red Cross is ready to help you by suggesting the right gift for the right man. Just call the camp and hospital committee of your local Red Cross and tell them you'd like to send a Christmas gift to a serviceman. They'll give you the necessary information. And on Christmas morning... You'll be twice as happy because you'll have brought a ray of happiness to someone who gave so much to give us the best Christmas gift of all, peace. Remember, the place to call is the camp and hospital committee of your local Red Cross. Don't put it off. Call tomorrow, won't you? And now, back to the whistler. For the first time in your life, you're beginning to lose faith in yourself. The shadow of a doubt is slowly making itself felt inside you. You keep telling yourself it must be a coincidence. How else could you and Kathy have had the same dream at the same time? A courtroom filled with roses. 
Yet she couldn't have pulled that one out of the air. It's too fantastic. It can't be coincidence. Yet what else can it be? Once again, you lie awake for hours trying to find an explanation. And then, just as before, it's all there in front of you, the same courtroom, just as you saw it last night from the press section. You're sitting there just as before, watching the witnesses, listening to statements by the attorneys. But this time, instead of roses, the courtroom is filled with Easter lilies. The same variety you found in the florist shop. Then slowly it melts away, and you lapse into the restful blackness of sleep. Seven o'clock. Kathy? Kathy? Yes, Chris? Where are you? I'm in the living room, dear. I'm coming. What's, what's the matter? Why don't you get up? Four o'clock. Four? Why? Oh, I, I couldn't sleep. You mean you had another dream? I don't know what's the matter with me, Chris. It, it's so, so real. Did you have another one? Tell me. Why, Chris. I'm sorry. Tell me about it. It was... It was just like before. The courtroom and the judge, but... But what? It... It wasn't roses this time, Chris. It was Easter lilies. Want to see me, Chief? Yeah, I just wanted to talk to you for a minute. What's wrong, Chris? Hmm? What's eating you? Well, I don't know. I... Ah, for years, I point you out to all the Cubs as a shining example. Everything a star reporter should be. And suddenly, your stuff starts coming in so garbled I can't use well, there's it. There's nothing wrong, Chief. Ah, don't hand me that. I know you too well. Something's eating your heart out, and I want to know what it is. Well, it's none of your business. It is my business. When the best man on my staff turns in a story on the shakeup at the city hall full of scrambled references to... Roses and Easter lilies, you can bet your shirt it's my business. What was that? You heard me. Uh, I, I guess I've just been working too hard. Is that all? Yeah. I, yeah, Chief, that's all. I doubt it. You've been through a lot tougher grinds than this, and I've never seen you fall to pieces yet. What's the matter, Chris? You look like a ghost. I told you that, that there's nothing the matter. I, I just... Need a rest. All right, then take one. A long one. How long? As long as you want, on full salary. And don't come back until you can write a straight story. Holloway? Uh, oh, yeah, Chris? Holloway, uh, didn't you do a story once on a professor over at the university? Something about experiments on extrasensory perception or thought transference or something? Uh, yeah. His name was Duncan, I think. What did he do? What was it all about? I don't remember very well. I, I think they'd line up a batch of students at one end of a room and have them concentrate on numbers. Yeah, yeah that was it. Mm -hmm. And then another group would try and write the numbers down. What's his name again? Duncan. Charles Duncan. really don't like to appear too definite on this, Mr. Claggett. Nothing has been proved conclusively. You mean there's no such thing as thought transference, Professor Duncan? It's hard to say. It's a very unscientific attitude to take, assuming that two minds are uh, in tune, so to speak. But we have found rare cases in which there seems to be no other conclusion. I see. Uh, does distance... Seem to make any difference? Oh, yes. Uh, I would say it cuts down the possibilities considerably. Uh-huh. Thanks, Professor. That's the only way you can explain it, isn't it, Chris? You and Kathy must be one of the rare cases the Professor talked about. There's no other answer. It's maddening to have carried it off so perfectly... To have won the outside battle so completely. Only to lose your grip on the secret while you're asleep and the bars are down. And there's only one defense, isn't there, Chris? He said that distance did make a difference. Hello, darling. Chris, what in 
the world are you doing home so early? Oh, I had a talk with Jones. He says I need a rest. Well, he's right. So how would you like to go away for a couple of weeks? Where? Oh, Tahoe, maybe. Why, I, I think that's a wonderful idea, Chris. Could you be ready this afternoon? Well, I don't know. It's a rush order. Oh, there wouldn't be much packing. We'd just knock around our old clothes. Well, I'll try. Great. Great, I knew you would. What about you? Well, I was about to tell you. I'll have to join you later. There's some things i got to clear up, you know. Well, why can't I wait? We could go up together. Now, don't be that way, darling. I want you to have it all ready for me when I arrive. I'll get your reservations <laughs> on the 3 o'clock train. How about it? <laughs> well, all right, Chris. Great. Well, gee, look at the time. we got to hurry. Come on, I'll help you. Well, Chris, she's out of the way for the time being. You're relieved for the moment. But the old tension returns that night as you lie down to sleep in Steve's house among Steve's things. She's at Lake Tahoe, Chris, 250 miles away. You keep telling yourself that distance will make the difference, just as the professor said. You try not to think of it as you lie there. Try to make your mind a blank. But the same impressions come back again and again. He's there, Chris. Steve is there in the courtroom with the flowers all around him. You sit in the press section, you can't take your eyes off him. He's smiling at you, Chris, as he gets slowly out of his seat and walks toward the witness stand, stepping carefully over the rows of roses and Easter lilies. You're going to talk, Chris. You realize there's no other way out now. Then you find yourself on your feet, shouting your lungs out, telling the court you killed him. I killed him! I admit it. I can't stand this any longer. I killed him because I loved his wife. I thought I'd I'd be happy, but I was wrong. I I don't care anymore. I I don't care. Well, good Lord. Oh, good Lord. (laughs) Cove, Lake Tahoe. Hello, this is Christopher Claggett. I'd like to speak to Mrs. Claggett, please. Just a moment. Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. She doesn't answer. All right, I'll call back. She doesn't answer, Mr. Claggett. I'll tell her you called. Hello? Hello, Kathy. Hello, Chris. Where have you been, Kathy? I've been calling you since 8 this morning. It's 4 o'clock. I know it. Why didn't you answer? I couldn't. I was so upset by... Chris. Chris, I had the dream again. It was awful. You're lying. No, Chris. It's no, impossible. I'm not. You couldn't have. It was your trial, Chris. Steve was there testifying. Stop it, Kathy. I tell you, Chris, it was real. I could swear I was right there in the courtroom. I said stop it. Listen, Kathy, listen to me. You've got to let me explain. Don't do anything. Don't see anybody. I'll be on the next train. It leaves Berkeley in an hour. There's only one way out now, Chris. It's you or Kathy. You did it once and got away with it. You're wondering now whether you can do it again. But there's no alternative, is there? It's you or Kathy. That's why, at five minutes past midnight, you're at Martin's Cove walking through the darkness behind the row of hotel cabins. You know Kathy's in number 16, and at this hour, she'll be sleeping. You keep well in the shadows of the trees at the edge of the cabin area. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen, this is the one. The window's open. You can see her head on the pillow. You pull out your revolver. You wish there were some other way. But there isn't. Just a moment now. Hey! What are you... Drop that gun! I got him! Let me go! I said drop that gun! All right, Claggett. Nelson! You can come along peacefully, or you can come feet first. At the moment, I am not particular. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. 
Meantime, here's an interesting feature about the new 1946 cars. One of the leading sixes advertises 25 to 30 miles per gallon. And throughout the field, auto manufacturers are stressing increased mileage. This is being done not just as a matter of economy, but because mileage is the result of better performance, a proof of greater efficiency. Well, as you know, signal gasoline has long been famous as the go-farther gasoline. But here's the important point. Signal Oil Company, always quick to give the motoring public the advantage of new trends, new improvements, has actually engineered new signal gasoline to help you go farther than ever. How Signal did it involves a long scientific explanation about rearranging the atoms in gasoline molecules to give amazing new power to new signal gasoline. The immediate noticeable results of this new power are quicker starting, faster pickup, and higher anti-knock. But because this increased power means you'll be shifting less, and shifting is the demon that wastes gasoline, your speedometer will prove to you that it's a fact. You do go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. So you finally lost the inside battle, didn't you, Chris? There in the shadows with Gibson pinning your arms to your sides and Lieutenant Nelson standing in front of you with a gun in his hand, you realize it's all over. You had the feeling from the first, didn't you? From the moment you killed Steve Robinson in the rear of his flower shop, you knew it was a losing battle. But it was too late to change anything. You should have known that it wouldn't go, Chris. How did... How did you know? Your wife called us. Thought so. Not until you confessed, of course. Confessed? Yes, all written out pretty as you please. Ten pages of it in your own handwriting. Garbled up with a lot of nonsense about roses and Easter lilies. What are you talking about? You didn't really think that you and your wife were dreaming the same dream, did you? My error. You must have. Or you wouldn't have tried to kill her. She wasn't asleep on that first night, Chris. She watched you get out of bed, take one of your spare notebooks out of the dresser drawer. I was writing. It was real. Well, the writing was real at least. You almost had a stump, though, when you sent her up here. We had to wait three hours until you went out for lunch to get into your house and find the notebook. She couldn't answer you when you called, of course, until we got to her by telephone and told her what she had dreamed last night. Well, that's it, isn't it? You were too good a reporter, Chris. A guy who can take notes without thinking should never take a crack at murder. Especially if he walks in his sleep. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, produced by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.